Welcome back to Federal Indian Gaming Law. Today we're going to cover the Wire Act Part 2. This is a bit of a refresher. Again, it was enacted in 1961, so it's only 16 years after the end of World War II. Can everybody see the slides? Okay. You know, prior to that, Congress held hearings on organized crime that really linked organized crime to interstate gambling rackets. Earlier in 1961, Eisenhower cuts off diplomatic ties with Cuba. Later in January 1961, John F. Kennedy is sworn in as president. The very next day, his brother is appointed as attorney general. RFK was active in those hearings regarding organized crime, and in particular, the hearings that linked organized crime to interstate gambling rackets. And he takes up the fight against organized crime in earnest. I mean, he, that was a, a top priority for Robert F. Kennedy was to go after organized crime. So what does the Wire Act say? Well, this is the prohibition section. It's 1084A, whoever being in the business of betting or wagering, and we kind of went over that a little bit. No one uses a wire communication for the transmission in interstate or foreign commerce of Bets or wagers or information assisting in the placement of bets or wagers in any sporting event or contest. Then we have a comma or for the transmission of a wire communication that entitles the recipient to receive money or credit as a result of bets or wagers, comma or for information assisting in the placement of bets or wagers. So you have that information assisting twice. And we talked about what it means to be in the business of betting or wagering. That was the Barborian opinion. You remember our boring opinion said, well, to be in the business of betting or wagering, you have to be engaged. The, it requires the sale of a product or service for a fee involving third parties, customers and clients. So the performance of a function that is integral to the part of such business and that you don't have to actually be exclusively engaged in that business. And if you're an agent or employee, you don't even need to share the profits or losses of that business, or receive compensation. But the function you perform has to be regular and essential, uh, a regular and essential contribution to the overall operation of the business. So, and we talked about these things, um, examples. But let's talk about the next section here, after whoever being a bit engaged in the business better betting or wagering. Let's look at knowingly uses a wire communication facility for the transmission in interstate or foreign commerce. And let's take a look at Yakinta. Yakinta's a 1961 or 62 opinion. Anybody read the facts of that one? Well, Essentially, what you have is an illegal horse racing bookmaking operation in West Virginia. So you have two people um, operating a bookmaking shop in Wheeling, West Virginia. You have two other people operating a similar bookmaking operation for off-track betting in Weirton, West Virginia. Both of these bookmaking operations are taking bets on wagers at Waterford Park near Chester, West Virginia. And in Chester, West Virginia, you have a person that attends the races and broadcasts them to another person outside the track who has a walkie-talkie. That person then uses a long-distance telephone to contact the bookmakers in Wheeling and Weirton. And Apparently, all the defendants knew that the long distance communications all went through East Liverpool, Ohio. This is back when you had the old telephone system where everything was direct connection. And we'll talk about that when we get to internet. So this is kind of what the map looks like. So the green area is where the green Marker is where the track is. Or, or, or I should, shouldn't say that, but the uh, yellow line is where the track is. The green marker is where the person that was relaying the information was located when he was calling the other two locations, Wheeling and Weirton. 
but everything goes through East Liverpool, Ohio, which is just across the river. So, you know, what, what's the issue? Alex. Yeah, it's essentially whether they, like, even though the end sort of receiving end was within the same state, whether the fact that it crossed the transmissions cross state lines at any point, sort of, um, it, whether that was intended to be within the statute. That's exactly it. You know, if you're the defendants, what are you arguing? I mean, you'd argue that it was in, within West Virginia from start to finish, kind of within the people who were communicating and receiving the transmissions. Yeah, exactly. It's, a, it's a, you know, hey, all right, so we're guilty of state law crimes, which are usually, you know, misdemeanors, um, often minor gambling crimes, you know, don't, don't usually have, you know, significantly severe penalties under state law often. So, okay, we're state law criminals, but we're not federal criminals. It's not a federal offense. And, it, you know, we're all in West Virginia. The race is in West Virginia. The walkie-talkies in West Virginia. The phone calls start in West Virginia. The phone calls end in West Virginia. This is a West Virginia issue, not a federal criminal law issue. But what does the court say? Courtney. Yeah, they say that like it did cross state lines. It, the communications left West Virginia, even though they ultimately came back into West Virginia. So it is a federal issue, violates the Federal Wire Act. Yeah, that's what the court said, you know, is that, you know, the, the Wire Act is supposed to be interpreted broadly. And it's supposed to stop organized crime activity. This is organized crime activity. And the activities that you're engaged in are the exact kind of evil that the Federal Wire Act is designed to prohibit. And on top of that, you, everybody knew that everything was going through East Liverpool, Ohio. Therefore, the Federal Wire Act is going to apply. So, with Yakinta, what about a Nevada book that's taking telephone wagers from in state bettors? You want to place a bet on, is it UNLV and Fresno State tonight for basketball? Anybody know? Wow, you know, the basketball is really falling off the map. <laughs> uh, you want to place a bet at a basketball game tonight? You call up, you know, the book that you have an account with, the licensed Nevada book. Is there a risk of violating the Federal Wire Act for that book? It's not uh, across state lines. Yeah, probably not across, that's the argument, but do you know it's gonna not across state lines? What about using a smartphone app that uses an internet connection? Courtney. I'm externing in federal court right now and we just had a case and they were saying like, basically anytime you use the internet, it's interstate commerce and the federal government has domain, so. I'd say maybe yes. I don't think it necessarily should be that way, but it seems like that's how things are being interpreted. Yeah, I mean, Yakinta is a West Virginia federal court opinion. We are not in the same circuit as West Virginia. And our, uh, our attorney general back in 19, the 70s, I think maybe even the 60s decided that that's not how the wire act should be interpreted against licensed gaming establishments. Now, early on, when we were taking federal or when we were taking bets over, over the phone, 
and we've been doing this for decades, is initially we were using caller ID to make sure that the better was in the state. Uh, now we use IP plus telephone. You know, if you're if you're using a cell phone, we'll use tower data and latency data to make sure that you're in the state. Another big difference is telephone systems changed a lot. Everything's IP based. And while the entire conversation between those folks in West Virginia went into Ohio and back, with the internet, it's not that way at all. Packets can take different routes. You don't actually have information. What you have is data. And the data may or may not make any sense. So is there a risk? Maybe, but remote. By the way, your kit has never been followed, never seen anything like it since then. And this is from the 60s. So it's been <clears throat> more than 50 years and it just hasn't been applied that way. Although there are some that wanted to enshrine it applying that way. We'll, we'll get to that later too, but not today. So let's take a look at the next section here. So we've gone through business, better your wagering. We've gone through wire communication and interstate commerce. Now let's take a look at bets or wagers or information assisting. I think a bet's pretty self-evident. What I mean, what is a bet? Nobody knows what a bet is? Courtney. Sorry, I can't find my mouse. Um, yeah, you're putting money or something of value down, predicting an outcome, and then you get compensation back if you're correct. Yeah, and, and who, are you, who are you putting that money down with and possibly getting money back from? The bookmaker. Yeah, and what, what what's that arrangement between you and the bookmaker? Say that again. What's the arrangement? Well, I mean, how would you describe the arrangement between you and the bookmaker? You have a... Contract. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> yeah, you have a contract. You have an agreement, right? That's what better a wage really is. It's an agreement. I'll put X down on the outcome of event Y. If it turns out that way, then you'll pay me, you know, amount Z or X plus Z. So it's an agreement. So the bet and the wager is easy, but information assisting is a little more difficult. So what do you think qualifies as information assisting? For those that haven't had, a gaming law class that goes over the wire act. Well, let's take a look at Scavo. Scavo's crazy on the on the uh, civil procedure side, but as it relates to the federal wire act, it gets relatively easy to understand. So this guy Scavo gets convicted under the federal wire act. Uh, his the wiretap tap, you know, uh, he had a wiretap on his phone line in 1976 uh, for an investigation that was centered on a guy named Dwight Medzo. Dwight Medzo was in uh, Minnesota. He was a bookmaker. Medzo and eight others plead guilty. Uh, Scavo's trial gets moved to Nevada, where he lived. Scavo's guilty plea is rejected by the court. <laughs> so he enters a NOLO plea and it gets sent back to Minnesota. Crazy, right? We won't accept your guilty plea. Um, so what did Scavo do? Well, Scavo lived in Las Vegas. And his job was to provide his buddy Betso with betting line information over the telephone. Now, you, you, most of you are too young to remember that Nevada had a prohibition on the use of cell phones and books. Up until about maybe 10 years ago, eight years ago, it was illegal to have a cell phone or a communication device in the bookmaking area of a Las Vegas casino or sports book. And there were no telephone 
pay telephones with an eyesight of the book. And this is why. So what he would do is he would go to Las Vegas casinos, write down the lines, run to a pay phone, call his buddy Mezzo with all the odds, lines, and spreads. So what's his argument that he shouldn't be convicted under the Federal Wire Act? Well, he argues, hey, I'm not in the business of betting or wagering. I'm just, I'm just providing information. And just providing information is not being in the business of betting or wagering. And he also tries to use the 1955 statute, the 18 U.S.C. 1955 statute, to say that he, he doesn't qualify. That's a different statute. We'll take a look at that uh, probably in about two weeks. Uh, so he argues, hey, I'm just providing information. And there's no, you know, there's no, no way to know if any bets actually flow from that information, right? And if I provide you information on a line about you know, a, a basketball game between UW Whitewater and Eastern Illinois University tonight. Nobody may bet that, right? It's not even information. It's just information. It's not part of a bet. And what does the court say to that? Of course, so no, this is information assisting, right? Viewed in the light most favorable to the government, the evidence showed that the appellate furnished line information to Medzo on a regular basis. So going back to that, uh, that rule, which is actually cited from this case, uh, that the bookmaker relied on that information, that there was some financial arrangement between the two, and that he was aware that Mezzo was a bookmaker and operating a bookmaking business. And that accurate and up-to-date information is of critical importance to any bookmaking operation. That information is key or relevant to operating a bookmaking business. So line information, point spreads, things like that, rotation numbers, are all information assisting. And what you get out of this, Dallin, question. I was just going to ask what your opinion is on this, if it's the exact same facts, but there's no established financial financial relationship. It would be harder, right? I mean, if, and, you know, there are lots of places to get line information today. Back in 1975, that was tough. Um, Today, if you're not getting any compensation for it, um, the, the problem is going to be is if, if it's an illegal bookmaker. So I think it still pretty much holds up today. So you, you, know, you bust an illegal bookmaker in Salt Lake, and that bookmaker in Salt Lake uses a service here in Las Vegas that provides up-to-date line information, I think they have some risk. Because what ends up happening is the police still arrest them. Generally, bookmakers are not solely bookmakers. Um, you know, they're kind of equal opportunity criminals. They may, uh, yeah, they may have a line on getting you a date for a fee. Uh, they may have a line on, you know, providing you with, you know, chemical uh, mood enhancers for a fee. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll, they'll collect all the information and then just start arresting everybody involved. Uh, today, it's probably unlikely, though, because most illegal bookmaking operations use offshores as their back end. This type of bookmaking is pretty much dead. We'll get to that when we talk about sports books. But Paperhead has taken over the illegal bookmaking market in a big way. And 
you know, so this stuff doesn't happen very often anymore, although it still presents a risk. Does that help? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I met some guys at a sports book in Reno once who they were from rural Washington. They were big Washington state fans. They look like uh, they just finished hunting and uh, they were telling me all about their illegal book operation. I was like, man, you guys really, this must not be a big thing if you're telling some guy you just met having drinks in Reno. Um, yeah, <laughs> I had a student some years back that worked, uh, at a local casino here that had people from another state that would come in periodically, drink, and then brag about their illegal bookmaking operation and, uh, and also about fixing certain games. They ended up all getting arrested. <laughs> so... Yeah, talking like that's never a bright idea. But hey, if you just came off the deer trail and you're a little buzzed and who knows. Um, Courtney. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I understand the up-to-date information because we talked about it last class too. Um, and it, so I just want to make sure I understand that it's important. It's different if it's like they're publishing line information like once a week versus. That's the yeah. argument at least. Okay. So we have we have businesses here that provide line information for a fee, and the argument they've been using uh, is that it's not up to date information, sort of like what you see in the Scavo opinion, right? That it's stale, even if it's stale by an hour or two hours, it's stale. Never been tested in court, but it's the argument. Now, a lot of them also have real-time services that you can subscribe to. And when we get to the Illegal Gambling Business Act, we'll take a look at this again. But I think there's, there's risk under the Wire Act as well. Today, less so. I mean, there's a, I didn't include it in, in your materials. There's a court opinion from the 80s about a service that provided uh, for NFL games, injury information, field conditions, weather conditions, um, for in, in stadium conditions for football games. And they provided the service for a fee, and most of their subscribers were bookmakers. And the court said that's information assisting in the place of bets or wagers because that's information that the bookmakers using is an integral part of running their business. Now, today, I just don't think you'd have that issue. You can get stadium weather information on the internet instantly, right? Field conditions instantly. Uh, news reports of this are everywhere. So I think the, the what qualifies shifts over time. We live in a, in a, in a different age than when this law was put into place. And on that, you know, think about it. You know, 1961, how many states had legal and regulated gambling, sports wagering? Anybody know? One. How many states had legal casino wagering? One. How many states had state lotteries in 1961? Anybody hazard a guess? I would get, I'm guessing zero because I don't think Nevada. Zero. Exactly. How many travel casinos were there? Zero. How many riverboat casinos were there? <laughs> zero. Today, how many states can you find some form of regulated gambling in? Any guesses? I think 48. I think Hawaii and... 48. It's a different world. It's a totally different world. So... Kind of keep that in mind as we're going through some of this. 
So again, you know, if line information and point spreads are common forms of information assisting, what else do you think might be information assisting? The amount of money being bet? Yep. Yeah, the amount of money being bet, risk information, uh, account information for player accounts. All those things have been deemed to be information assisting. It's the information bookmakers use to operate their business, to offer wagering. It's not the information that creates the wager or creates the agreement. It's the information used by the bookmaker to run their business so that they can create agreements and take bets. This becomes important Monday. Uh, I think we'll get, the, we'll get there one day. Let me start looking at the exemptions. So let's move on to the next piece of this. We had information assisting on any sporting event or contest. So let's talk about that phrase in the context of in-ray MasterCard. Anybody read that one? Know the circumstances of that? The facts? Now, you have a bunch of people that lost money playing on offshore casinos. And how do they fund their gambling on offshore casinos? Well, they fund it with credit cards. But, you know, it's pretty hard to take an offshore casino to court in the United States. You know, even if you get a judgment against, let's say, a, you know, an online casino in Vanuatu, how are you going to enforce it? or in Costa Rica, or in Antigua, or in the Kanawaki Nation. I mean, there's really no way to enforce it against those, those foreign operators. You can get a judgment, you'll have a nice piece of paper, you can hang it on the wall, you can pay all your legal bills, and you might even get travel damages back, but how are you gonna enforce it? You know the Costa Rican authorities aren't going to enforce it. Folks out in Vanuatu aren't. So who do they go after? Well, they go after the credit card companies. Why? Because the credit card companies get a small fee for each transaction. So I go online, I play some blackjack, I spend $1,000. Well, the credit card company is going to get a small percentage of that in credit card fees. And so what they're arguing is that the credit card companies are part of a racketeering organization in interstate and foreign commerce. So what they're going after are RICO claims. Anybody familiar with RICO? Get a couple of heads bobbing up and down. RICO is designed to go after organized crime. So what you argue is that there's a racket going on in violation of federal law and you can sue anyone and everyone that's involved in that racket. And what they're saying, here we have a racket where there is illegal online gambling occurring in violation of the Federal Wire Act, and the credit card companies are facilitating it and making money off of it. Therefore, they're part of the racket, and we're entitled to recover, recover trouble damages under RICO. So anybody know how the credit card company industry works? No? Yes. Uh, let's take a little look at it.
there are a lot of credit cards out there. Discover, American Express are worth mentioning, but I think most would agree that the two that truly stand out are Visa and MasterCard. They're the two most widely accepted cards in the U.S. and internationally. They're the two biggest by almost any measure, and I'd argue they shape the industry more than any of the others. They're both Fortune 500 companies with very strong brands. I thought this was interesting. To prove the strength of their brand, Visa recently did a study in 16 countries that found when consumers see that Visa logo, they're three and a half times more likely to think a website is more secure. Now, I think this is a common misconception, so I should make it clear right away that these are not banks. They do work with the banks, but they both identify themselves as a technology company. When you pay your credit card interest or late fees or whatever, that goes to your bank, not Visa or MasterCard. Visa and MasterCard make money from the bank or whoever's issuing the card. They charge a fee that's dependent on how much the card card is used. And then they also do all this data processing behind the scenes type stuff that I won't be talking about any more in this video. There's some other stuff too, but that's where most of the revenue comes from. Now, let's take a look at these two, how they've helped shape the industry, how they've competed over the years, and where they stand today. The concepts behind these cards date back hundreds of years, if not thousands of years in some cases, but they can be hard to trace and not completely relevant to what we're talking about here. As far as I'm concerned, the first tangible examples of what resembles what we know today were in the early 1900s. It was when companies would issue their own cards to their customers. Stores were a common place to see it. Like, if it were the 1920s and I were the owner of the general store in town, I might offer a means for you to buy your items on credit. The idea being that maybe you could purchase more and then you'd be more likely to return to my store as opposed to a competitor. But these cards were always very small in scale because they had no reach. They were good at one store or one business, so it was impossible for them to grow. For decades, that was the state of the industry. Until 19 1950 with the introduction of the Diners Club card. That was the first ever card to be accepted by multiple businesses on a large scale. It was accepted mostly by entertainment providers, and within its first year, it had 20,000 holders. Then in 1951, Franklin National Bank introduced the first card that was actually provided by a bank. And I think that the success of it made the other banks see the potential of the idea. It wasn't long before all the banks across the country were providing their own version of a charge card. And I should make that clear. These were considered charge cards, not credit cards. The big difference being that the full balance had to be paid at the end of each month. There wasn't any revolving balance, no minimum payments, there wasn't any interest, which could be good in some cases, but I would consider it a limitation of the service. The other big limitation was geographic. It was difficult to expand their reach because each bank would have to make a deal with every merchant in their area for them to accept the card. And for those reasons, the cards that each of these local banks issued were generally only accepted in their local areas. Then in 1958, Bank of America changed the game when they combined three words into one and introduced Bank AmeriCard. This was what many people considered to be the first modern day credit card. It had the revolving balance, the minimum payments, the interest, and it had reach all through California. In 1965, they found an effective way to expand their reach beyond their state. They would license their card to local banks across the country and have those banks do all the work in establishing it in their area. Let me explain a little further. Bank America card had a recognizable trusted name. It was accepted in more places than any other card, so it was attractive to customers. If I were a bank in Memphis, you could see how offering this card to my customers would be beneficial to me. Then, it would be up to the Memphis bank to make the deals with the local merchants to have them accept the card and then issue the card to their customers. The end result was hundreds of banks across the U.S. setting up their own little Bank America card system in their community and paying the Bank of America for the right to do it. As another service of the Citizens National Bank of Ironton. Meanwhile, in 1966, when all of that was in motion, there was an unrelated credit card forming in a much different way. See, this group of banks, mostly in California, but they stretched across America, all of which were unassociated with Bank AmeriCard, came together to start a new card. The newly formed company was called Interbank Card Association, and the new card was called Master Charge. With a collection of already established banks backing it from the beginning, it grew pretty fast. So now 
now we have Master Charge and Bank AmeriCard, the first two major credit cards. They offered a very similar product, but the organizations themselves were set up very differently. One was centrally ran by a single bank, Bank of America, and the other one was ran by a collection of banks. There was no one else offering credit cards at this scale, so it became almost impossible for any independent bank to compete with them. As a result, just about every other bank was sort of forced into joining up with one of them. In 1970, Bank of America got rid of Bank AmeriCard and sold it to National Bank AmeriCard Incorporated. I realized that was an incredibly confusing sentence, so let me explain. It's actually pretty simple. A group of those banks that were paying that licensing fee to Bank of America to issue the card, well, they came together to establish a company that would buy the card. So now, much like Master Charge, they too were owned by a collection of banks. Four years later, they bought the international side of the business from Bank of America as well and combined it all into one company. And here's the part that I'm pretty sure you've been waiting for me to say this whole time. Two years later, they changed the name of everything from Bank AmeriCard to Visa. But that name change was actually more meaningful than you may expect. At the time, they were pushing really hard to become an international brand. But they had the word America right in the middle of their name. They didn't like the idea of marketing it that way in other countries, so instead they chose to use different names depending on the area. I think they were using 20 different ones at one point. They actually specifically chose the name Visa because it didn't connect them to a certain area, and it was easy enough to pronounce no matter what language you spoke. That name change allowed them to turn into a single, uniform, international brand. And this is probably the other part you were expecting. Two years later, Master Charge became Master Card. I want to say that this was an indirect result of Visa's name change. Because for Visa, it was probably the biggest part of a transformation plan at the time. And it was really effective. So it forced Master Charge into their own transformation plan to respond. Part of which was offering some new services and changing their name to reflect the fact that they were no longer just a charge card. So that's how we get the two companies. There's so much more to compare over the years, but I'd summarize it by saying that one of them would introduce something or at least popularize it, and the other one would follow. I'm talking about things like traveler's checks, that magnetic strip on the card, ATMs, debit cards, the different card levels. So now, today, we have two very similar companies. If you're wondering if it's smarter for you to get a MasterCard or a Visa card, in most cases, it really doesn't matter. As I said, it's the banks that control the rates and the terms, and then the stuff that they do control is practically the same at this point. Now, looking at the two as direct competitors, the company that became Visa was first, so they were obviously ahead for those first eight years. But then, the company that became MasterCard had a solid backing to start, so they quickly pulled ahead and stayed there for more than a decade. But then, when Visa changed their name and made that aggressive international push, they pulled ahead somewhere around 1980. And that's about it. It hasn't changed again since. Visa has been the leader of the two for decades now. This is worth mentioning, though. In the late 1990s, MasterCard gained a little ground from their successful marketing campaign. Do you remember this one? They would list the monetary price of a bunch of items people were using. And then in the final one, they'd list usually more of an experience and say that it was priceless. And then the voiceover would come on and say, There are some things money can't buy. For everything else, there's MasterCard. It was really effective. But I think because it showed money can't buy everything but it can sort of push you in that direction. I don't know if I'm explaining that right, but at the very least, it exposed a perceived soft side of the company. It just made them look like they cared. In 2006, MasterCard went on the stock market with a massive initial public offering, and then two years later, Visa did the same thing, but even bigger. They've both been dealing with antitrust lawsuits from just about every angle you can imagine. In almost any aspect, I can't find many major differences between them other than their size. I'll make the general statement and say Visa controls almost half the market, whereas MasterCard controls somewhere between a fourth and a third of it. Here's some direct comparisons. Their revenue is considerably larger for Visa, as we would expect, but they're both growing at a similar pace. And then their net income shows something somewhat similar. All right, here comes some of the 
biggest numbers that you will ever see on this channel for their total transactions, it was 188 billion compared to 103 billion. The amount of those billions of transactions totals to $11.4 trillion for Visa compared to $5.9 trillion for MasterCard. For the number of cards in circulation worldwide, it's $3.3 billion compared to $2 billion. I also want to point out that the combined 5.3 billion cards represents about 85% of the market, which means if you have a card from your bank, there is an 85% chance that the logo says either Visa or MasterCard. Here's my summary. The credit card industry has grown tremendously over the past few decades, and the credit card networks have grown proportionally with it. Just think of it this way. This is a concept that hardly existed before the 1950s, and now the average American has thousands of dollars in credit card debt. But there hasn't been much change between the networks. If one of them makes a big change, the other one tends to follow. And in the end, they are both advancing, but the distance between them never changes much. So so now, just like 30 or 40 years ago, we have Visa with a commanding lead, MasterCard following behind quite a bit in second place, and then no one else with a realistic chance of catching up to either one of them anytime soon. Let me know in the comments, do you agree with that statement, or are there any other companies contributing more to the market than I'm giving them credit for? Am I underestimating Discover Card or something like that? Also, what's your perception as far as the difference between them? Because from everything I've seen from the customer's end, I can't even identify a difference significant enough worth mentioning. Do you even care what the logo says on your credit card or debit card? Or if you do, be careful not to reveal too much personal information, but I'd be curious to hear why. From your perspective, what is the difference between Visa and... Oops. So you kind of get the idea, right? The credit card companies are really facilitate the connection between banks and merchants and customers. So you have a card holder who's a customer. He goes to shop at a merchant's location. That merchant has an agreement with a merchant bank. The merchant bank has an agreement with the payment processor. The payment processor has an agreement with the card association. That's the Visa MasterCard. Amex, Discover. The card association has a relationship with the issuing bank, the bank that actually issues the card to the card holder. And then you have these independent sales organizations or membership organizations that outsource some of the computing power. So you can kind of see that what the plaintiffs in this case are doing is they want to hold the card associations liable as being part of a racketeering operation for the illegal activities of merchants that they are doing business with, whose services they avail themselves of. So let's take another look at Kind of reinforces uh, this. I think is an ad from from Visa. So, so who is it. involved in a payment card transaction? Wow. There's the merchant, the merchant's bank, the customer, the customer's bank, all whom agree to comply with PCI, the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. To accept payment cards, the merchant signs an agreement with their bank called the acquiring bank to comply with the regulations of the bank and card brands. The merchant's acquiring bank agrees to comply with the regulations of the card brands, including the PCI data security standards. The customer has a credit card. By signing the cardholder agreement, the customer agrees to comply with the regulations of the bank and the card's brands, including PCI. This bank is called an issuing bank because it issued the credit card. The issuing bank agrees to comply with the regulations of the card's brands, including PCI data security standards. A customer pays the merchant with a credit card. The merchant submits the cardholder information to the acquiring bank. The acquiring bank pays the merchant and submits information to the payment card company. The payment card company submits the information to the issuing bank. The issuing bank bills the cardholder. The cardholder pays the bill to the issuing bank. 
your role as an employee of the merchant is to ensure the cardholder's credit and debit card information is treated in a manner that meets company and PCI security standards. So the, again, another good illustration of this. See, the cardholder that wants to hold the merchant's acquiring bank, not the merchant's acquiring bank, but the credit card association liable for the illegal acts of the merchant. All right? That makes sense? This is the Visa ad. Um, kind of explaining what Visa services are today. Almost everyone knows the Visa brand, one of the most trusted and recognizable in the world. But not everyone knows what Visa does. A credit card company. Not a credit card company. Is it a bank company? Nope. They loan money. Try again. They lend the money to you and then they charge your bank account later. Sorry. I have no idea. Oh! Can I have a clue? Visa is a payments technology company that facilitates commerce around the world. Whether you're making a purchase, sending money to a friend, or part of a business moving money to another business. Visa pioneered the electronic payments business more than 60 years ago, envisioning a world in which paying for something could be translated into electrons and photons that move across the globe at the speed of light. The consumer may access an infinite range of goods and services whenever he chooses, wherever he may be. Today, there are more than 3 billion Visa accounts around the world in more than 200 countries and territories. During fiscal year 2019, more than 200 billion payments and cash transactions were made with the Visa brand, representing more than 11 trillion in payments and cash volume, from the largest cities to remote communities across the globe. Each transaction made on the Visa network represents a packet of data that moves across a massive telecommunications network, more than 10 million miles in length end to end. The network is made up of fiber, ethernet, wireless, satellite, and virtual connections, linking consumers, businesses, governments, and financial institutions. The journey of each transaction starts with you. When you click, swipe, dip, or tap to pay, data about the transaction travels from the store owner to their bank or processor, which captures the information and sends it to VisaNet. VisaNet uses artificial intelligence technology to analyze every aspect of the transaction to determine the level of risk <laughs> for fraud. VisaNet routes the information to the bank that issued the customer's credit or debit account. The bank decides whether to approve or decline the transaction based on Visa's risk score and its own data about the account. Traveling back through VisaNet, the approved request returns to the store owner where the transaction is completed. Later on, Visa makes sure the money is transferred. This authorization all happens in less than one second, whether you're in Miami, Madrid, or Mumbai. Making sure that every transaction flows instantly are several global data centers synchronized in real time so that if one system experiences issues, another picks up. Software developers and other partners can use Visa's developer tools to build innovative ways to pay. As a payments leader, Visa is extending the boundaries of our network and the potential of billions of connected devices, bringing the security and reliability of our brand to customers across the entire payments ecosystem. Digital commerce can extend to even the most remote regions where people who don't typically bank can access the benefits of mobile technology. Despite the growth of digital payments, about 1.7 billion people still lack access to formal financial services and consumers spend nearly 17 trillion in cash and checks. Meeting this opportunity is the mission of Visa's more than 19,000 employees committed to accelerating the global migration to digital payments to enable individuals, businesses, and economies to thrive. You might not know what Visa does because the inner workings of our network are not visible when you're making a payment, and they shouldn't be. Speed, security, and convenience are what drive our business, so you can get on with yours, no matter how, when, and where you choose to pay. I'll so again, you get the idea, right? So how many of you have cash in your wallets right now? 
one, two, three, four people. Uh, how many of you have credit cards in your wallet right now? Like everybody? Yeah, I mean, uh, credit card transactions are just about everywhere now. Um, and, and, you know, with smartphones, you know, you can do it with NF, NFT payments, um, or not NFT, uh, <laughs> NFC payments, sorry. Uh, so near field communications, you know, Apple Pay, Google Pay. Um, but it's all driven by MasterCard, Visa, Discover, Amex. And so what do you think happens if you hold Visa and MasterCard and Discover and Amex liable for the criminal acts of merchants who they don't have an agreement with? Again, kind of going back uh, a couple of slides ago. Oops. You know, again, you have the, pay, the, the card association has an agreement with the payment processor that has an agreement with the merchant bank. The merchant bank actually vets the merchants. I don't know if you could see the cursor or not. So you've got the card association agreement with the payment processor. The payment processor has the deal with the merchant bank who has the deal with the merchant. Card associations really have no idea who the, who the merchant is, except for the information they get from the merchant bank through the payment processor. So what do you think happens to the credit card industry if you hold the card associations liable under RICO for the illegal acts of merchants? Outside the case, just what do you think? Courtney. I think the industry would collapse. Yeah, <laughs> I think it would too. So with that in mind, let's go through, <laughs> let's go through this. So if you're the credit card associations, uh, what do you want to do with this case? Even if you didn't read it, what would you want to do? Well, you want to get rid of it, right? You want to get rid of it quickly. So, oops, chat just came in. Hold on. Yeah, get it dismissed. Exactly. Um, so they file a 12B6 motion. Anybody familiar with what that is? Failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. So that's what they file. Now, again, you're the court, you're the judge. You've got a case before you that's, that it wants to hold the credit card associations liable for the criminal acts of merchants that they don't have a, you know, they don't have a direct privity with. And so what do the credit companies argue for their 12B6 motion? Well, they argue that there's failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted because the Federal Wire Act only applies to sports wagering. Remember that on any sporting event or contest language from the prohibition language? And since they have an alleged losses on sports wagering, you can't grant relief on those claims. Therefore, it's a fatal defect in their pleading, and you can't grant relief on that, and you have to dismiss this case court. And of course, what do the plaintiffs argue? Well, the plaintiffs argue that the Wire Act doesn't require a sporting event or contest to be the object of, of the gambling. And I should say that the Department of Justice was in agreement with the plaintiffs. The Department of Justice said that, well, sporting event or contest means sporting events, which are the things you're thinking of, you know, athletic events, football games, basketball games, things like that, horse races. But contests are separate. And sporting event or contests. And contests are things that have a certain three elements. What, what, what do you think those three elements are? No guesses? 
how about how about consideration, chance, and prize? <laughs> we spent a little bit of time on that, right? Um, so that was the DOJ's point of view, and that's what the plaintiffs are arguing. You know, what's the court's initial impression? Well, they're gonna look at the statutory language and see if it's clear. They said, you know, to us, it looks clear that the object has to be a sporting event or contest. And we see that in the exemption as well. Therefore, we think it only applies to sports wagering. Now, again, what do you think the court's trying to do with this case? Do you want to be the judge that takes down the credit card industry? You know, what is it, $17 trillion in transactions or whatever? It's a vital part of the economy. I mean, how many of you, you have used a credit card in the last week? You know, I don't think I've used cash in the last week, but I have used a credit card. Um, yeah, the court, I think, is looking for a way to get out of this, too. Just, I guess. I mean, if I were the judge, that's what I'd be doing. I don't want to be the judge that kills the economy. Um, so the plaintiff says, well, you have to look at the legislative history. The legislative history doesn't say that it has to be sports betting. And the court said, well, first of all, we don't have to look at the legislative history because it's clear. But even if you do, the legislative history supports the, the notion that this law was passed with an eye towards bookmaking and sports wagering. So the matter gets dismissed by the, by the district court. And if you're the plaintiffs, what do you want to do? Courtney? Yeah, you want to appeal it. Hey, exactly. And it goes to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. And what's the standard of review? Well, it's de novo. Fifth Circuit can look at this de novo. And they do so, and they say, you know what? Even in looking, even if we accept the facts of the complaint is true, construe the allegations in a light most favorable to the plaintiffs, um, it's not going to suffice to prevent a motion to dismiss. They essentially agree with the district court. So the district court agrees, or the Fifth Circuit agrees, that the plaintiffs can't rely on the Wire Act as a predicate offense. Now, having said that, what, you know, if you're a plaintiff's attorney, what do you want to do now? Well, you might want to take leave to amend the complaint, right? They weren't allowed to. <laughs> and that's why I think the court wanted to get rid of this. Um, normally you would let them, I mean, you haven't, the only thing that's happened in this case is the complaints have been filed, the cases were consolidated, a 12B6 motion was heard, the credit card companies won the 12B6 motion, plaintiffs appealed it, the Fifth Circuit upheld the 12B6 motion, then the plaintiffs, you know, you haven't had a case in, in, in you know, you haven't gotten discovery, you haven't gotten to, you know, anything other than serving the complaint and, and addressing the 12B6 motion. Normally, you'd be able to amend your complaint. Here, they weren't allowed to. And I think, again, I don't think anybody wanted to touch this one. I mean, if you, if, if you allow credit card users to recover for this, can they recover that if you know, the merchant made a, you know, as a fraudulent advertisement, you know, their advertisement goes beyond mere puffery. And can you sue the credit card company that earned a quarter of a percent on the transaction or whatever? I mean, it would, you'd, you'd destroy the credit card industry. So let's leave it here because to take up the next piece is going to take more than 20 minutes. Questions?
just jump to the question slide. 